Marie-Joseph-Paul-Yves-Roche-Gilbert de Motier de Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette. One of the heroes, one of the young men who were heroes of the American Revolution. Not a lot of people really know his story. So today we're going to dive into biographics and their video, Marquis de Lafayette, the hero of two worlds. And uh, I'm excited to tell the story in particular because by the time you guys are watching this, I will be on my way to Paris. And one of the places that my daughter and I are going to be visiting while we are there is the cemetery where Lafayette is buried. It's a very unique place because... Uh, he and his wife are buried in the cemetery where over a thousand victims of the guillotine are buried that were killed during kind of the height of the, the terror. And there's a reason for that. It's because his wife's sister, mother, and grandmother all went to the guillotine during the war, uh, during the, the terror that happened there. So um, that eventually led to war. But uh, it's a fascinating story. He's a fascinating figure in history. I think a hero of two worlds is a very apt description of him. So as always, the link is in the description if you want to check out the video without my commentary and see a lot of the other biographics stuff that has been done over time. And I've done a number of their videos, and I'll put some links up at the end so you can check out some of the other ones that I've done. Let's dive in. By Squarespace, from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. Sometimes history throws us a figure so dynamic it seems like they've witnessed every important event of their era. In the case of the Marquis de Lafayette, he didn't just witness these events, he often caused them. Born in the latter half of the 18th century, Lafayette's life reads like a spec script for an epic Oscar winner. As a teenager, he fought in the American Revolutionary War. As a young man, he spearheaded the first phase of the French Revolution before fleeing a death sentence at the guillotine. He was friends with George Washington, Louis XVI, Thomas Jefferson, and Simon Bolivar, and was instrumental in both the downfall of Napoleon and the revolution that overthrew France's last Bourbon king. In short, Lafayette... Now not only that, though, he's really good friends with Alexander Hamilton, and we need to not forget that, because Hamilton's a founding father. Hamilton spoke fluent French, which is one of the reasons why these guys hit it off. You know, Lafayette's a major general in the American army. Hamilton is on the staff of Washington. They work very closely together dude who packed a lot into his seven decades. But while he remains famous for his role in the Revolutionary War, how much do we really know about the rest of his life? About the man who was at the forefront of not one, but two French revolutions? Join us today as we peek inside the life of the Marquis de Lafayette, the man who changed the fate of both America and Europe forever. Hmm. Not an understatement. When the Marquis de Lafayette was born on September the 6th, 1757 in France, it was into an old noble family of soldiers. In fact, the Marquis de Lafayette is an aristocratic title. But since his real name was Marie-Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert de Motier, Marquis de Lafayette, we're just going to go with Lafayette for the rest of this video. And that's how he's remembered and that's you've got towns all over America named after him. After him, probably the most prominent one is Lafayette, Indiana, but there are a lot of them it's easier. But while young Lafayette was both pampered and connected, he learned to ride horses in the company of three future kings, life wasn't exactly easy. When he was barely two, his father was killed fighting in the Seven Years' War. By the time he turned 13 in 1770, he'd also lost his mother and his grandfather. Still, the gigantic fortune he inherited must have softened the blow. Come 1774, Lafayette was married and a courtier at the Versailles of newly crowned King Louis XVI. But Lafayette came from fighting stock. The pompous luxury of Versailles bored him. He wanted to win glory as a soldier, to go and fight in some 
Great War somewhere. Luckily for him, one of the greatest wars in history was about to blow up. On April the 19th, 1775, the growing animosity between Britain and its American colonies finally exploded when a bunch of soldiers and local militiamen clashed at the towns of Lexington and Concord. It was the opening salvo of the Revolutionary War, often referred to as the shot heard around the world. Over in France, the Marquis de Lafayette certainly heard it. By the summer of 1777, 19-year-old Lafayette had become so obsessed with the war raging in America that he decided to go and join in. That July so remember that, what he just said, 19 years old. Lafayette was a teenager when he came to America and ends up a major general in the American army. Now here's the thing, there were a ton of these guys. Lafayette was just one of a mess of Frenchmen and, and Germans and people from other countries who, who flocked to America hoping to get some, they basically all, they were these European uh, aristocrats who all saw America the same way, this backwoods country that desperately needed the leadership of qualified European officers to take control. And Washington certainly was not that, right? So, so a lot of these guys showed up thinking they were going to be given these really high-ranking positions in the American army. And some of them would even go see Benjamin Franklin in Paris, for example, and get a letter from Franklin. Come to America and say, here, I have this letter from Benjamin Franklin, and he says you should give me a position. And so a lot of these Europeans were given like these honorary titles, these honorary ranks, but never really actual combat positions. Lafayette's one of the rare exceptions to that, where he not only becomes a general in the American army, he really, truly does lead troops in some of the most epic moments of the war. He arrived in Philadelphia, where he presented himself to the Continental Congress. The Congress took one look at this scrawny teenager with no battle experience and told him to perform an act of intercourse upon his own buttocks. At least they did until the Marquis declared that he was willing to fight for free, at which point the calculation changed. In the summer of 1777, the war was not going well for the Americans. Smallpox was devastating their ranks. they had only won symbolic victories as opposed to useful ones, and the British were on the verge of capturing Philadelphia. Right now, Congress would take any free help they could get. Which yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and here's the thing. Why were these guys willing to do this? Because so many of them recognized that the way you win glory in 18th century Western culture is you lead troops on a battlefield. Alexander Hamilton is a teenager growing up in the Caribbean. He was writing about this. He writes, I wish there were some war somewhere where I could, because he saw that he was like from a poor family in the middle of nowhere. And on his own, he was never going to get anywhere without something happening that he could get involved in and make a name for himself. And all of these young guys, that's what they want. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to do something that's going to help them to rise above their station. In Lafayette's case, he's got the station, but he wants to make it a name for himself. Which was how George Washington found himself on July the 31st, face to face with a rich French teenager who'd somehow been given the rank of Major General. Washington had been saddled before with useless European royals who came over to fight because they were rich and looking for adventure. Invariably, they turned out to be useless even as cannon fodder. There was no reason to assume that this new one would be any different. But Washington's snap judgment would turn out to be wrong. Over the month of August, 17. Lafayette rose from being someone Washington couldn't stand the sight of to his personal favorite. It helps that Lafayette was brave in battle and a natural leader of men. It likely helps even more that both Washington and Lafayette were looking for someone to fill an emotional hole in their lives. As many have noted, Lafayette wound up becoming the childless Washington's surrogate son. At the same time, Washington seems to have filled the father-shaped void in Lafayette's life. And he didn't just do that for Lafayette. He did the same thing for Alexander Hamilton, who grew up without his father. Uh, from like the age of 10 or so. Uh, but Washington called his staff his family. And so he, he very much did view uh, many of these young men, these 19, 20 year olds, Washington's in his, in his 40s at this point. Uh, he, he did view them as kind of a, a childlike figure to them, a son, a surrogate son. And uh, they're not at all off base in saying that that was the relationship these guys had. We became incredibly close in a matter of weeks. Where Lafayette was wounded in the Battle of Brandywine that autumn, Washington had his personal physician attend to the lad. It was the start of a long relationship that would hugely influence both men. It would also hugely influence the course of American history.
Under Washington's tutelage, the Marquis soon bloomed into a great general. He pulled off an impossible retreat from Barren Hill and was instrumental in harrying Benedict Arnold's forces in 1781. More importantly, though, he soon became the fledgling nation's best ambassador. Yep. In 1779, Lafayette returned to France Guns to and ships. drum up support for the American revolutionaries. Although so this that scene is portrayed in the musical Hamilton, where uh, you have Lafayette, who at the start, when you're first introduced to him, uh, and, and it's a fictional version because they met when Hamilton was already on Washington's st staff, not before the war. But uh, you have Lafayette, who hardly speaks English, going from that to saying some of the toughest lines in the whole thing, where they uh, they do this song called Guns and Ships, where it says, how does a uh, ragtag volunteer army in need of a shower somehow defeat a global superpower? How do we emerge victorious from the quagmire, leave the battlefield waving Betsy Ross's flag higher? Yo, turns out we have a secret weapon, an immigrant you know and love who's unafraid to step in. He's constantly confusing and confounding the British henchmen. Everyone give it up for America's favorite, favorite fighting Frenchman. And then Lafayette shows up and he says these super fast lines. He says, I'm taking these horse by the reins, making red coats red with blood stains. I'm never going to drop until I make them stop and burn them up and scatter their remains. Watch me engage in them, escaping them, enraging them. I go to France for more funds. I come back with more guns and ships. And so the balance shifts. 100% true. That is all to say that Lafayette was... As much as he was important on the battlefield, Washington and the Continental Congress recognized his importance as a key component. By this point, there's already an alliance between the United States and France, but France, in the eyes of Americans, is not doing nearly enough to help. The U.S. needs money. It needs guns. It needs the Navy the French have, and these are going to be key aspects of how they win at Yorktown. And a lot of it happens because Lafayette goes over there and says, hey, we need more. Though Louis XVI didn't need much convincing that screwing with Britain was très bien, it's still impressive how much aid the Marquis returned with. Yep. In April 1780, Lafayette triumphantly reported to Washington that 6,000 infantry and six ships were on their way from France. Yet his most impressive moment of all would come in 1781. That summer, in the run-up to Yorktown, Washington ordered both Lafayette and Mad Anthony Wayne to head south into Virginia. Both their troops mutinied at the news of yet more fighting, but while Mad Antony lived up to his reputation by executing the ringleaders and displaying their bodies, Lafayette took a different approach. He told his men they were free to go. He leveled with his soldiers, saying they were heading into danger, that many of them wouldn't make it, that the British might annihilate them all. But he also reminded them what they were fighting for, why they'd signed up to be here in the first place, what this new nation could represent. In the wake of Lafayette's speech, nearly all of the deserters returned. Lafayette rewarded them by spending his own money on new boots and blankets. And mm. then, as one, they marched down toward Yorktown and into history. It was Lafayette's troops who partly yep. was responsible for trapping Lord Charles Cornwallis at Yorktown in late July. Once Cornwallis surrendered on October the 19th, it was effectively the end of the Revolutionary War. So, the last part of sealing the trap on Cornwallis's troops at Yorktown are these redoubts that are known as redoubts 9 and 10. Once redoubt 9 and 10 fall, the British are in a untenable situation in which they're going to have to surrender. And this is where Alexander Hamilton gets his chance to lead a battalion in combat, and he's leading a battalion under his friend Marquis de Lafayette, who has personal command of this attack on redoubts 9 and 10 uh, that basically wins the war. In the aftermath of the British having their asses handed to them, Lafayette was hailed as the hero of two worlds. Yep. Many of the states made him an honorary citizen. Returning to France, he was promoted to Marshal de Camp, or Brigadier General. It was a proud time in the Marquis' life. Not yet 25, it helped engineer the success of the American Revolution, at that time the most significant revolt in living memory. Little could he have known that this was just a warm-up for the main act. And as Americans, that's kind of where the story ends for us with Lafayette, right? Even though he does come back for this big tour at the end of his life, which is really fascinating stuff, uh, Americans kind of don't know much about what happens once Lafayette goes back to France. And by this point, he's got a son named George Washington as well. In the latter half of the 1780s, France made a grisly discovery. It was broke. The royal treasury was empty. Credit lines were maxed out. 
In the face of a countrywide financial collapse, Louis XVI made a fateful decision. He summons the Estates General. The Estates General was a meeting of France's three estates, the aristocracy to which Lafayette belonged, the church, and the commoners. Generally, French kings avoided calling the Estates General. The last meeting had been in 1614, 174 years previously. But if Louis wanted to head off the brewing crisis, he had no choice. On May 4, 1789, 1,200 representatives of the three estates convened in Paris. Among their number was Lafayette, elected as a deputy of the nobility. Mm. But while Lafayette was lumped in with all the other French fancy pants, he wasn't just another posh twit. He'd spent years immersed in the ideals of American independence, yeah. and now he was going to bring them to France, whether his countrymen liked it or not. He and who's there in France at this time? Thomas Jefferson as an ambassador to France. And he and Lafayette are going to get together and write, I'm sure they'll talk about the Declaration of the Rights of Man. States General officially opened on May the 5th and quickly devolved from a meeting about state finances to a massive pile-on in which everyone took turns bitching about the Ancien Regime. The commoners were fed up with living in convoluted backwards France filled with pointless privileges and regressive taxation. But they were also fed up with being outvoted and pushed around by the other two estates. So on June the 17th, the third estate's deputies declared themselves a sovereign national assembly. Yeah, and why does that matter? Because the third estate made up by far the majority of the population, but they still only had one vote out of three. The whole thing was organized with the help of Lafayette, one of the few nobles who joined the assembly. The king tried to counter by having the meeting hall locked, but the assembly repaired to a tennis court where everyone took an oath not to disband until they'd forced a liberal constitution on France. And they had just the guy to write it. With help from his buddy Thomas Jefferson, Lafayette drafted the Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen, one of the most important documents ever written. In it, Lafayette sat out his conception of universal rights with a strong emphasis on personal liberty. And why is this fascinating? Because this is coming from the nobility. It's not coming from the third estate. It's not coming from the commoners. This is one of the nobles who writes this, who sides with them. And yet his family suffers horribly in the aftermath. Although the assembly would redraft his work before adopting it, Lafayette's ideas still heavily influenced the final version. But the Marquis' effects on the French Revolution weren't going to stop with one document. Three days after Lafayette presented the assembly with his draft, a Parisian mob stormed the Bastille and the Paris Hotel de Ville, a fancy name for City Hall. The morning after, representatives of Paris's 60 districts convened on the hotel and declared the creation of their own national assembly, the Paris Commune. As part of this shake-up, a citywide national guard was formed to replace the king's men. And who could be a more natural fit as commander of the guards than the hero of two worlds? On July the 17th, a reluctant Louis came down from Versailles to meet the man now heading the army that effectively controlled Paris. He was taken inside the Hotel de Ville, where someone pinned a revolutionary red and blue cockade on his chest. Lafayette saw the king wearing the cockade and had a flash of inspiration. Taking some white cloth, white being the color of the Bourbon monarchy, he added a strip to the king's cockade. Then Lafayette and Louis XVI both went out onto the balcony where the gathered Parisians shouted, long live the king. It was the birth of the- People forget that part, right? Everybody thinks the Bastille is stormed, it's revolution, the king is overthrown. It didn't quite happen like that. They weren't all ready to just overthrow the monarchy. They just wanted to shift it more to like what the UK ended up with, a constitutional monarchy. The tricolor, the revolution. Yes, I know it wasn't the UK yet. It's still Great Britain at this point. All right. Revolutionary symbol that is still the flag of France. It was also, the Marquis hoped, the birth of a liberal republic, one in which the king was a figurehead and the actual governing was done by middle-class business types. But the Marquis would be proven wrong on this one. Far from wanting the king as a figurehead, the people of Paris were soon going to realize that they preferred their kings without heads at all. The wheels on Lafayette's plan started coming off that same autumn. On October the 5th, a riot over bread prices in Paris turned into an army of heavily armed, very unhappy women. The next day, they marched on Versailles, some 19 kilometers distant. When Lafayette got word, he first tried to stop them, only to realize his guardsmen would mutiny if he did so. So, the yeah, so you don't mess with the women, right? There's a number of times in history before women have the rights that they have today, before women have the right to vote, for example, or the right to own property, or even in some cases to testify in court, uh, women are 
primary movers and shakers behind some of these movements. The French Revolution is one. The temperance movement here in the United States is another one where, where women had a huge role. And then, of course, when you get into industrialized warfare, the, the role that women have in keeping the war machine going uh, by working in factories and things like that. Let's not forget that even when they didn't have uh, necessarily political rights, women were still immensely important in so many of these conflicts. The Marquis changed tack and rode out to the head of the angry women, nominally there to protect them, but actually wondering what the hell he was going to do. When the mob arrived, Lafayette zipped inside the palace to try and convince Louis to announce his support for the Assembly's liberal reforms. But while he was talking, the crowd invaded the palace, where they killed two guards and stuck their heads on pikes. The situation getting desperate, Lafayette forced the king out onto a balcony to say his peace. It was a tense moment. The crowd could have easily broken in and lynched not just Louis, but Lafayette yeah. too. Luckily, though, the plan worked. The crowd began hollering, long live the king, then offered to escort Louis and his family back to Paris. We so it's interesting to see how, because when we hear about these events, we don't hear about Lafayette's prime role in these events. And you can see how he's trying so hard to not only fight for the same kinds of rights that he fought for with the American army in the revolution, but also to try and steer the people into doing this in the right way. Some of the same kind of stuff could have happened in the United States. There were very extreme voices in the U.S. Sam Adams, for example, he's more on the kind of the, the zealous extreme end of things. There were men who wanted to resort to that kind of violence. And, and had they been given their way, there were people who probably would have happily lopped off the heads of uh, any British soldiers they captured or anybody else like that. But uh, thankfully, in the case of the American Revolution, cooler heads prevailed and more stable way of doing things comes about that doesn't happen in France. He say offered, but it was more like they ordered him on the strict understanding that saying no would result in his head being stuck on a pike too. And so the royal family were escorted back to the capital and effectively imprisoned in the Tudier Palace. But Lafayette had bought them time. Not only that, he'd bought himself influence with the mob. From now on, he was going to be at the very forefront of the French Revolution. For the next year and a half, that's exactly where Lafayette stood. As the assembly abolished feudalism and stripped powers from the aristocracy, he was the most visible symbol of the changes. Under his watch, the bourgeoisie gains new rights. It was the mannered liberal revolution of Lafayette's dreams. Sadly, so why, it was why is it grasp. important the that... Marquis uh, can get to pause, right? Why is it important that he is seen as one of the uh, figureheads of this? Because this shows, at least probably the way that the mob is viewing us, and by mob I mean the majority of the people in this case, uh, this shows that it's not just a peasant's revolution or a middle class revolution, that the aristocracy, that the very people that these rights and, and influence are being stripped away from, that even some of them are behind it. And, and a guy who's already had a history of fighting in revolutionary conflict. Uh, it's a great propaganda tool to have a guy like Lafayette as your, uh, as kind of your picture of your revolution. A fall from grace came on July the 17th, 1791. On that day, the Paris National Guard opened fire on a group of protesters demanding the king's resignation. 50 people were injured or killed. As commander of the guard, Lafayette's popularity plummeted. He resigned his post, had himself transferred into the army. With Lafayette sidelines, the radical elements began gaining power. By April 1792, the crazies were so in a sense that France declared war on Austria, beginning a series of conflicts that would rack Europe for a quarter of a century. Sent to lead one of the three main armies, Lafayette returned from the front to Paris twice to denounce the radicals and plead for common sense. But no one was listening. On August 10, 1792, a working-class revolt in Paris overthrew the monarchy and brought the hyper-radical faction headed by Robespierre to power. Seeing which way the winds were blowing, Lafayette abandoned his post and crossed the lines into enemy territory. It was just in time, too. Before news even arrived of his desertion, the assembly declared Lafayette a traitor, effectively an invitation to come and dance with Madame Guillotine. But although Lafayette escaped with his head, his nightmare wasn't over. Arrested by the Austrians, the Marquis spent the next five years shunted between jails, gloomily listening as the news from France got worse. Six yeah, and you know you got to feel bad for Lafayette because he he supported the revolution until it got stupid. 
right? Until you get to the terror and they start, you know, this turns into mass hysteria in some ways. There are parallels all over the place between this and like the Salem witch trials, right? You don't like your neighbor, accuse them of being anti-revolutionary. It's a great way to get them, you know, and, and to get them out of the way. And it got to the point where there were so many people being accused and so many people that were facing these courts that they had to streamline the process, right? And they just basically were like, it, it was like cashing out at the, at the grocery store. It was like, all right, you're guilty, guillotine, you're guilty. And, and something like 40,000 people end up being executed. And the majority of them were not in Paris. They were all over the country. It wasn't just in Paris this was happening. Six months after Lafayette crossed the lines, Louis was guillotined, ending Lafayette's hope of a constitutional monarchy. Another six months after that, the reign of terror began. Although his former comrades in America begged for his release, there was nothing to be done. Lafayette had been sentenced to rot in a cell, and rot he would, at least for a while. Because in just a few short years, a great man would ride the Marquis's rescue, perhaps the greatest man in European history. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, and he would transform France's fortunes. During Lafayette's years in prison, the situation in France gradually reversed. On July 27, 1794, also known as Nine Thermidor Year Two, Robespierre was overthrown and subsequently guillotined. In the wake of the Thermidorian reaction, the Directory rose to power. Corrupt and reactionary, the French Directory would last a mere four years before it too was overthrown. But luckily for our story today, it did two very important things in those four years. The first was to promote a promising young general named Napoleon and get him to invade Austria to force an end to the war. The second was to insist any peace deal included the freeing of the Marquis de Lafayette. Good for them. On September the 19th, 1797, Lafayette walked free of his Austrian prison. At first, the Marquis was like, man, this Napoleon dude is awesome. But soon, he was feeling significantly less cool about France's new hero. He was worried about Napoleon's ambition, about his lust for power. But if you see a common theme in Lafayette's life, right? He is enthusiastic and supportive until you get extreme. Napoleon became extreme. He started invading. He started conquering. Lafayette couldn't support that. The revolution was something he could get, get behind until it became extreme, until they started going after people. That's when he couldn't support it anymore. If Lafayette thought Napoleon's ambition was a bit much now, wait until he saw what happened next. On November the 9th, 1799, Napoleon overthrew the Directory in the coup of 18 Brumaire. In place of the Directory, he installed himself as the first consul of France. Dramatic as this was, though, Lafayette's attention was elsewhere. On December the 14th, George Washington passed away in Virginia. Having already lost his real father, the Marquis now had lost his surrogate one. This may help explain why Lafayette spent most of 1800 out of the picture. It wasn't until autumn that Napoleon tried courting the hero of two worlds. The incentive was an ambassadorship to America. When Lafayette gently sounded Napoleon out on France becoming a democracy, the reply he got wasn't encouraging. So imagine how epic that would have been, though. Marquis de Lafayette, Napoleon Bonaparte's ambassador to the United States. And it would have been perfect timing, right? Because in 1801, Thomas Jefferson, Lafayette's friend, becomes president. It would have been a great match, but he couldn't support Napoleon as a dictator. Lafayette turned down the post and began speaking out against Napoleon. In May of 1802, he was one of the lone voices to vote against Napoleon, becoming the first consul for life, declaring, I cannot vote for such a magistracy until public liberty has been sufficiently hmm. guaranteed. But that guarantee never came. Lafayette retired from public service that same year. Although Thomas Jefferson offered to make him governor of newly purchased Louisiana in 1803, Lafayette refused. He also refused another offer from Napoleon to be given an elevated rank in the Legion of Honor. When the first consul finally had himself named Emperor Napoleon on December the 2nd, 1804, Lafayette seems to have given up on politics entirely. But while he'd stay out of the game for nearly a decade, he wouldn't be able to resist coming back. In April 1814, the War of the Sixth Coalition ended with Napoleon abdicating and being sent into exile on the island of Elba. In the wake of the empire's collapse, the Bourbon monarchy was recalled to the French throne in the portly shape of Louis XVIII. That's, that's an understatement, the portly shape. Louis XVIII was a big dude. He's the brother of Louis XVI. 
sight of yet another fat Louis on the throne wasn't exactly music to Lafayette's soul. In his heart, he was still a child of the American Revolution and would prefer a world without royals. But when forced to choose between another Bourbon king and Napoleon's continued reign, the Marquis knew who he preferred. On March 1, 1815, Napoleon escaped the island prison and returned to France. Louis XVIII fled and the Emperor marched on Paris, kick-starting a period known as the Hundred Days. Disgusted at Napoleon's resurrection, Lafayette left retirement. He took up a post in the Chamber of Deputies, determined to become a lone voice against the Emperor's tyranny. Instead, he wound up helping end his rule for good. In the aftermath of Waterloo that June, Napoleon's brother came to the Chamber to rally support for the Emperor. Instead, he was forced to listen as Lafayette made a barnstorming speech laying the deaths of millions Napoleon's feet. Not wrong. He said many of the younger deputies hadn't realized until that moment that Lafayette, by now pushing 60, was still alive. Regardless, the speech worked. In its aftermath, Lafayette led the charge for Napoleon's second abdication. On June the 22nd, the emperor obliged. Before Napoleon went into his second exile, the Marquis went to the Tuileries Palace to thank him. There, Napoleon met him not with anger or outrage, but with a wry smile. Hmm. You got rid of me, we like to think that smile said. But now the Bourbons are back, the kings you fought so hard to rid France of 25 years ago. What are you going to do now? But Lafayette would soon have an answer. Although no one in 1815 could have realized it, the Marquis was destined to extinguish the Bourbon line once and for all. <laughs> I love how this guy's life is so intertwined with some of the most important events in world history, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, amazing stuff. And then he has this connection to Western revolutions. Well, the next 10 years were a decade of disappointment for Lafayette. Initially willing to give Louis XVIII a chance, he soon became convinced that the king needed to go. Starting around 1819, Lafayette began clandestinely funding liberal plots to overthrow the monarchy, but they went nowhere. By 1824, the Marquis was frustrated and all too aware that the Bourbons were catching on to his schemes. He needed a break, a place to lie low and recalibrate, a place where he didn't carry all the baggage that he did in France. Luckily, that place was only a boat ride away. That year, President James Monroe wrote to Lafayette asking if it attend celebrations of America's 50th anniversary. By now, Lafayette was the last surviving major general of the Revolutionary War, one of the last links Americans had to their nation's birth. Lafayette accepted. On July 13, 1824, Lafayette left France to begin what would become a 13-month victory tour of all 24 U.S. states. Where and if you ever get the chance, read into this tour. It's amazing all the places he went and the way he was received. He was legit treated like the hero that he was of America. Uh, and uh, there's actually, um, there are organizations that are dedicated to telling the history of this victory tour. It was that big a deal. It was like headline news stuff all over the place. Wherever he went, he was fated. Across 9,600 kilometers, he was cheered, welcomed, and honored. It was a colossal outpouring of love. Yeah. Towns were renamed after him. If you live in one of the dozens of places in the U.S. named Lafayette, chances are it was named during this journey. By the end, the Marquis had seen Jefferson for the last time and visited Washington's grave. He'd even met Simon Bolivar's nephew, who was studying in the United States. When Lafayette heard the great South American revolutionary had been inspired by his exploits, he decided to write to him. And that's how Bolivar and Lafayette wound up becoming pen pals in the last years of their lives. That's cool. By the time Lafayette left America on September the 6th, 1835, he was pretty much all loved out. And that was probably for the best, because France was by now a pretty unlovable place. Back in 1824, Louis XVIII had died, and the throne had passed to his brother, Charles X. But while Louis had been a royal pain, Charles was a throbbing dick. Convinced of his divine right to rule, he tore up the last shreds of French liberalism, replacing it with a hardcore Catholic, hardcore conservative, absolute monarchy. It was all Talk about being tone deaf. Like, did you not pay attention what happened to your family in the previous decades? Did you not pay attention to what France does to an absolute monarch? Almost like the revolution had never happened. Charles was trying to turn back the clock to 1789. Lafayette's last great act would be ensuring that he didn't succeed. On July the 26th, 1830, Charles pushed something called the Four Ordinances, effectively a royal coup. 
They suspended freedom of the press, stopped almost everyone in the nation from voting, and removed the last checks of the king's power. Charles thought it would be fait accompli. Instead, it became a revolution. For Parisians, the four ordinances were the last straw. They rose up spontaneously, driving Charles's forces into retreat in just three days, known as the Three Glorious Days. But while the Marquis and his liberal friends were happy to see Charles go, they were less happy at the thought of all these angry Parisians suddenly wheeling out the guillotine. So yeah. they decided to get out ahead of the revolution while they still could. Conscripting Charles's cousin, Louis Philippe, they had him ride into Paris, draped in a tricolor, right through the revolutionary crowds, all the way to the Hotel de Ville. There, awaiting Lafayette, took the future king up to the balcony, just as he had done with poor Louis XVI all those decades ago, and waving the tricolor, the two men embraced. At the sight of the hero of two worlds bestowing his blessing on the new king, the crowd went nuts. With that one kiss, Lafayette ended the July Revolution. A few days later, Louis Philippe was made head of a liberal, business friendly monarchy with proper checks and balances. It was the moment the Marquis had dreamed of since 1789 a liberal system for France in which the king was mostly a figurehead and individual freedoms were secured. But you know what they say? Be careful what you wish for. Over the next four years, Lafayette grew increasingly disillusioned with the July monarchy and its slow, bumbling toward authoritarianism. By the end of his life, he was one of Louis Philippe's harshest critics, a constant thorn in the king's side. Luckily for the new king, Lafayette wouldn't be around much longer. On May the So yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where it's like, I'm your friend as long as you are on our side and you're not extreme. And again, the more he goes toward extreme, the more Lafayette's going to be your vocal critic. I, I so much admire Lafayette's just his integrity with this stuff, right? He, there were so many times in his life where he could have compromised for the sake of getting himself ahead. But he always stuck to what he believed. He always stuck to his principles, and he didn't care who he had to oppose to stand for those principles. 1834, aged 76, the Marquis de Lafayette died in Paris. Although many mourned him, Louis Philippe refused to allow eulogies at his funeral, even having him buried under armed guard. It was a bitter end to an extraordinary life. In his seven decades on this earth, Lafayette had repeatedly found himself at the center of events that changed world history. The Revolutionary War, the French Revolution, the downfall of Napoleon. These are all hugely significant events that would have played out very differently without yeah. the Marquis. And then there are the documents that he left behind. The modern French constitution still incorporates the Declaration on the Rights of Man over 200 years after Lafayette wrote it. But it's not just what he did or who he met that makes the Marquis impressive. It's what he stood for. All his life, Lafayette was a tireless champion for individual liberty yeah. and freedom from tyranny. 100%. These were causes that took him to the battlefields of America, into the heart of France's revolution, even into an Austrian prison. Time after time, people asked him to sell out. Napoleon, Louis XVIII, Louis Philippe, and each time, the Marquis never wavered in his yep. beliefs. It's often said that for evil to succeed, all it takes is for good men to do nothing. The life of the Marquis de Lafayette takes that saying to its opposite extreme. It shows what can succeed when a good man decides to do something, to stand up, to act, to be counted. When a man like Lafayette decides to do that, well, then he can change the world. And not just a good man, a great man, truly a great man. And I want to end with one of my favorite uh, speeches from history. I want to read it to you real quick. Lafayette brought the French to the American Revolution, and without French intervention, the U.S. does not win independence. That's just an absolute fact. In 1917, the United States joins the war in Europe to fight to defend France and sends a million men to fight. And when the first began to arrive, there was this big ceremony at Lafayette's grave in the Picpus Cemetery uh, in Paris, and Colonel Charles Stanton was the one who spoke these words. And I'm planning next week when my daughter and I are in Paris to read these words at Lafayette's grave. I love it. I absolutely, absolutely love it. It's been misattributed to Pershing. It was definitely Charles Stanton who said it. And this is what he said. He says, America has joined forces with the allied powers and what we have of blood and treasure are yours. Therefore, it is that with loving pride, we drape the colors in tribute of respect to this citizen of your great republic. And here and now, in the presence of the illustrious dead, we pledge our hearts and our honor in carrying this war to a successful issue.
Lafayette, we are here. I love that. Absolutely love it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.